Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you my colleague and mentor, Professor Richard Fuller. Dr. Fuller is Professor of Physics and Hanson Peterson Professor of Liberal Studies at Gustavus. He has been at Gustavus since 1968 and has played a very important part in making the physics program what it is today. Professor Fuller will introduce our last speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Russell. Thank you, Chuck. I must start by telling you about a dream I had last night. Um, it was from Denver, Colorado, and it was Bill Dean reminding me of how I got here. I'm taking his place. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Robert J. Russell as our next speaker at this 33rd Nobel Conference. Dr. Russell is among the top four physicist theologians on this planet. When we tried to decide who to invite for this position, it was Bill Dean who called his mentor and Robert Russell's mentor, Ian Barber, from Carleton College. And with Ian's endorsement, there was no doubt that we had to get Dr. Russell. He has a PhD in physics from the University of California in Santa Cruz, a, ma a master's of theology degree from Pacific Lutheran School of, or Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, he is currently professor of theology and science in the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and the founder and director of the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences in Berkeley. Dr. Russell has received numerous awards and honors for his most significant contributions to the ongoing global conversations between theologians and scientists. Among these awards are the Templeton Prize and several distinguished lectureships. He has been an editor of four highly regarded books in theology and science. He has authored over 70 papers on topics relating to major concerns of both science and religion. We could find no better or no more highly qualified speaker to address the concerns of this conference. Robert Russell cares very deeply about the conversations between science and theology and religion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert J. Russell, who will address us on the topic how the heavens have changed. Dr. Russell. That's good. Thank you, Dick, for that excellent introduction. Fortunately, it reverberates so much up here, I couldn't hear it, so I don't need to fake modesty. I'm not really sure what you said. <laughs> President Stower asked me if I'm going to show a slide of God. Unfortunately, I had one, but I pulled it in advance because the, the picture was a bit fuzzy, but it looked an awful lot like Axel Sauer. <laughs> it's a great honor to address this crowd with a history of science education and the broader question of human values and human meaning that this conference and conferences like it have addressed. Thank you for the privilege of my being here. I hope these remarks help to set a tone for our conversations together. How the heavens have changed. The past two days have been filled with a vastly new vision of our planetary system resulting from four decades of space exploration. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union took the first step with the launching of Sputnik, followed almost immediately by the U.S. launching of Explorer 1 and its discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts circling Earth. In the decades that followed, we saw such triumphs as Apollo 12's landing on the moon in 1969, the Mariner and Viking missions to Mars during the 60s and 70s, Pioneer and Voyager's journeys to Jupiter and Saturn, Giotto's 1985 encounter with Halley's Comet, the COBE satellite discovery of variations in the microwave background radiation in 1989, the Hubble telescope launched in 1990, and our current exploration of Mars that we've heard about today and yesterday from Professor Stone. We've seen some spectacular photos from these explorations in the past two days. 
but let's enjoy a brief sample of some of them once more. The surface of Venus from the Magellan spacecraft. Remember this view from the Viking II lander? Jupiter as seen from Voyager 1. The complex structure of Saturn's rings. As well as the dark clouds of Neptune seen here. The picture of Pluto and the Saturn Charon seen again through the space, the Hubble Space Telescope. You can compare this with the best ground based in image of the planet and its moon on the left, taken from the 3.6 meter telescope, Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Finally, let's enjoy our own planet Earth, seen from Apollo 17. Here's Typhoon Uri. Look at the detail in this photo of Mount Vesuvius in the Bay of Naples. The Discovery Space Shuttle took crew took this picture of the Southern Lights across Australia. And finally, the whole Earth as a composite panorama constructed from totally cloud-free pictures from the NOAA weather satellite, thanks to Tom Van Sant, Lloyd Warren, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. These missions have forever changed our understanding of the solar system and our role in it. And they have raised important questions about religious faith as well. Do you remember the famous quib by the Russian cosmonaut circling the Earth? Well, I'm out here in space, so where is God? I want to explore with you a serious response to this today. But if I had to get a, give a quick and dirty one, I'd say, that's like a fish asking, where's the ocean? You're swimming in it, my friend. God is everywhere. We are always in the presence of the ongoing creator of the universe. Still, it isn't only our knowledge of the heavens that's changed. The universe itself is in a tremendous process of change extending back over billions of years. Gone is the static cosmology of Greek and biblical days, <clears throat> as well as the fixed and eternal cosmology of Copernicus and Newton. We now believe the universe began in an infant explosion called the Big Bang some 15 billion years ago, an event called T equals zero, or the beginning of time. And the universe is still expanding outwards in time. 10 billion years ago, First, thank you. First generation stars formed out of massive proto galaxies. After percolating along for billions of years, many of these stars went supernova, fusing what remained of their hydrogen and helium into heavier and heavier elements and spilling them across vast, the vastness of interstellar space. Then, some five billion years ago, New second generation stars, like our own sun, were born in these element rich fields, vacuuming up dense matter to form a brood of planets flocking in lazy orbits about them. Occasionally, the right conditions prevailed, as we have just heard from Professor Stevenson, where oceans of organic molecules, violent atm atmospheric storms, impact of meteorites, and volcanic dynamics made conditions ripe for the first signs of life. Give things another 4.5 billion years or 3.8 billion years, depending on the calculations, and we find Homo sapien making tools and rocketing into space and relishing in the sheer joy of being alive in this glorious universe. Once again, Hubble brings us some astounding photos of a universe in dynamic process and change. Here is the first direct image of a distant star. It's Betelgeuse, a red giant, a red supergiant, lying in the winter constellation Orion. 
We've seen this already, but I think it is one of the most beautiful photos Hubble has given us. Lying within the Eagle Nebula at a distance of 7,000 light years, we see pillars of cool interstellar hydrogen gas and dust protrude from the interior wall of a dark molecular cloud. These pillars are incubators of new stars. Hubble also shows us stars in the process of dying. When stars like our own sun die in a supernova, the expanding remnants of their outer atmosphere form a planetary nebula, like this one lying 3,000 light years away in the constellation Cygnus. This striking Hubble picture shows three rings of glowing gas encirculating the site of the 1970, uh, 1987 supernova. The actual supernova took place roughly 170,000 years ago. Beyond our galaxy, the Milky Way, lies an endless array of galaxies. This is one of the nearest galaxies to us, about 1.8 million light years away. It is a member of the cluster of galaxies which includes our Milky Way and is called the Local Cluster. Credit for this picture and the next one goes to David Malin at the Anglo-Australian Observatory. As we move further away, we encounter the Virgo Cluster, lying at a distance of about 50 million light years. Hubble shows us this photo of the Como Cluster of galaxies seen in the background at 300 million light years. And at 500 million light years, Hubble shows us a rare head-on collision between two galaxies. The violence of this collision triggered the formation of new stars, estimated to number perhaps in the billions. At the edge of the visible universe lie these immensely powerful, highly compact quasi-stellar objects, or quasars, which may represent the first stages towards the formation of galaxies. Finally, data shown here from the COBE satellite depicts slight variations in the temperature of the microwave background radiation, which comes to us in all directions and is left over from the very early universe. These slight variations might be just what is needed in terms of Big Bang theory to account for the eventual evolution of slight perturbations and then the production of quasars and galaxies. Back in the 50s, when I was a kid, most of these discoveries about the universe and our solar system lay in the future. But the feelings of longing and anticipation were intensely present even then, driving my whole generation to yearn for space. During high school, I was living in Los Angeles, California. After school, I loved to visit the Griffith Observatory, nestled atop the sloping hills of Hollywood. There, near the end of the main display hall was a large black and white backlit photo of what at first appeared to be a field of stars in the nearby arms of our own galaxy. Looking more closely though, I could see them for what they really were, a field of galaxies, far, far beyond the confines of the Milky Way, our home. Galaxies so distant and so ancient that the light captured by that picture was emitted millions of years ago, even billions. Now, this astonishing Hubble photo captures that same intense feeling, a deep field of galaxies. I love to go back again and again to that special picture, even now, to re-experience the sense of wonder at the sheer grandeur of the universe. How could there be so many galaxies and so many, many stars? To gaze at that picture gave me an intense joy, for the astonishing fact is that, in a fundamental way, I'm part of that picture. Each of us here today is what the stuff of that first-generation stars, in our part, small part of our Milky Way, eventually became. 
Their supernovas produce the heavy elements that compose my flesh and yours and that of all life on Earth. In a certain sense, each of us here today represents the future of ancient stardust come alive in a sentient creature. And we are connected indeed with the remote, remote past and the vast environment of space. Yet with all these changes in our understanding <clears throat> of the heavens, and they are immense indeed, some things don't seem to change all that much. <clears throat> One of these is the deepest question, why? Why does the universe exist? This is, of course, an ancient and enduring question of the world's religions. It is frequently seen as the question of origins, did our universe have a beginning in time, or is it eternal? The monotheisms of the West, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, understand God to be the creator of the universe. This is usually meant both that without God, the universe would not exist as such, and that God created the universe in the beginning. Now science might shed light, or some light, on this question of God as science wrestles in its own way with the question of the beginning of the universe. I do, however, want to be very clear at the outset about the grounds for faith in God as I see them. For most people, faith does not come primarily from science or cosmology or from philosophical arguments for the beginning of the world. It comes through that elemental religious experience of being encountered in the present moment and throughout one's life by the God whom I can name because of God's own self-revelation in the history of Israel and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. It means da daily living in the presence of one who can ground life's joys and transform its sours. Religious experience involves prayer, scripture, worship, yet the transcendent can come as well through reason and mathematics, art and the music we've heard today, moral conscience, such as concern for the environment, and the forgiving intimacy of loving and being loved. The experience leads to a total reconfiguration of all aspects of life around an integrating vision which gives wholeness to life and hope to the future. But faith as a relationship to and a trust in God must also be spelled out in terms of a framework of meaning, a systematic approach, a theology, which requires self-critical scholarship within an ongoing academic discipline of inquiry. And theology, in turn, I claim, must be brought into mutual and creative dialogue with the discoveries of the natural sciences. It is at this level of theology, then, that I can return to the question whether the concept of creation at the beginning, in theological language, is at all consistent with contemporary cosmology. For example, according to the original Big Bang model I referred to earlier, the universe as a whole did have an absolute beginning some 15 billion years ago. This claim would tend to corroborate what Western monotheism has contended about creation without directly proving it, any more than an eternally old universe would flat out disprove it. To use a legal metaphor, if the defendant in a court of law is the theological claim that God is the creator, the Big Bang might act as a character witness, but it can never serve as an eyewitness. Meanwhile, scientific and theological theories change, and the original Big Bang model has been modified to include an incredibly rapid inflation in the very first split seconds before the universe settled down to its usual Big Bang expansion rate. In this if this revised model is correct, the inflationary epoch acts like a veil, shrouding what lies before it in mystery. 
But there have been even more drastic modifications of the Big Bang model, which attempt to treat the very early universe in terms of quantum physics. According to these approaches, our universe may have arisen from a previous superspace or mega universe, and the process of universes generating universes could go on endlessly. So while science does shed some light on whether the universe, at least our part of it, began a finite time ago, which it seems to have, it may or may not settle the question of the ultimate origins of the universe. Meanwhile, theologians, in most part, will turn to their original question as being even more fundamental. Not just origins, but why does the universe exist at all, whether or not it's eternal? Why is there something and not nothing? Now, some scholars feel that the universe itself is its own best answer. This, of course, was the eloquent response offered by Carl Sagan. All of us owe Dr. Sagan a tremendous debt of gratitude, not only for his enormous contribution to science education, but for his moral voice and conscience in being concerned about our planet and life on Earth in its varied forms. Through his magnificent Cosmo series and through his many books and lectures, Carl Sagan brought to the American public and the international public a knowledge of and a love of the universe. He is also well known for his pithy rejection of organized religion. So it is hardly surprising that he began the entire Cosmos series with an atheistic answer to our question. And I quote, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Now, though I believe in God, I agree with Dr. Sagan up to a certain point. In effect, I take him to be saying, there is no mysterious intracosmic force or natural process which could produce the totality of all that is. No Star, War, Star Wars force that guides Jedi masters. No New Age cosmic mind that thinks the universe into being. No innate quantum power of matter to actualize itself. No life force that animates matter. Nothing we can think of by analogy with the forces and matter within the universe is an adequate grounds for causing the universe as a whole, as a cosmos, to exist. I believe Dr. Sagan is absolutely correct in this point. It was the centerpiece of the Hebraic conception of God, that God is not a natural force or worldly power but instead the transcendent creator of the world and everything therein. Although science has vastly expanded our knowledge of what that world is, nothing we have discovered could undercut the biblical insight that the powers of nature become idols when we raise them to the level of ultimacy and in so doing mistake them for the Lord God. But does Dr. Sagan's answer go far enough? Is the fact that the universe exists a sufficient explanation of that fact? For millennia, people have sought a deeper explanation in terms of that ultimate reality, that infinite, eternal, and necessary being on which all creaturely things depend, and without which nothing finite would exist. In his remarkable book, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking wrote that even if we could find the ultimate scientific theory, it would still be, quote, just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? The usual approach of science of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the question of why there should be a universe for the model to describe." Unquote. In fact, the concept of God speaks to a further question which deserves our attention here. The intelligibility of the universe is an absolutely foundational assumption of modern science. Scientific inquiry assumes that we can find out about the world by experimenting by devising theories to account for the results, 
and by expressing them in simple mathematical equations. But why should this be so? Why, first of all, do experiments give us reliable knowledge of the world? And secondly, why is the universe organized and structured according to the laws of physics we write down, which are truly simple? Instead of being so complex that its underlying laws might never have been discovered by us. Finally, why do these laws in particular make possible the evolution of creatures like ourselves who ask this kind of question? Why is a child of a particular hominid species on a small planet orbiting a star some 30,000 light years from the center of a routine galaxy capable of discovering the secrets of the universe? As Albert Einstein remarked so poignantly, the eternal and incomprehensible mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. These really are profound questions, admitting of many responses. The one I find most satisfying is that the God who creates the universe intentionally gave it the kind of mathematical structure necessary for the evolution of life and mind. The assumption of intelligibility which lies at the heart of science and which remains, as Einstein puts it, the eternal mystery to science, leads us to the theological insight that God gives to the universe its intelligibility, its order, and its simplicity, precisely the characteristics which make our science possible. Moreover, the radical changes in the universe which we have discovered suggest a God who is continuously creating the world around us, who is the ongoing source of the changes, quote, in heaven and on earth, to use the traditional phrase, whose creative willful intentions are what we experience directly as the changing processes of nature, even as God's faithfulness is the source of the laws science discovers about nature. Clearly, this is not an absentee deity who sets the universe in motion and then leaves it to its own devices, a deity with, to quote, nothing left to do, as it were. If there were no beginning, no t equals zero. Instead, the processes of nature which God discovers are the ongoing action of God in the present. A God who, though transcendent, the utter mystery of existence and its source, is also the most imminent and present actor in the universe, ever present, ever creating, through the very processes of nature which science studies, ever caring for all that exists, every sparrow that falls. This is the living God who is ever crafting this gorgeous, richly diverse, immensely wondrous universe in which we live and move and love and hope and dream and explore. And so we can truly respond to our cosmonaut friend by proclaiming the God whose presence and power fills this boundless universe. And so I think back to that photo at the Griffith Observatory so many years ago. Oh, how our knowledge of the heavens has changed since those days, and how much the feeling of being part of the universe has increased because of this new knowledge, leading me to a loving God who rejoices in the ongoing creation of this wondrous and immense universe. Rocket Summer. Leave it to Ray Bradbury to capture for my whole generation, and with that one inimical phrase, the thrill of the first day of summer vacation with his promise of the adventure of space. Even now, some 40 years ago, I can still recall the flood of excitement and the exuberance of that moment when, with the last day of school behind me and the shimmering heat of summer bursting all around, I'd put on my new sneakers and dash through the screen door to run headlong into that all-consuming joy of possibilities and wildly serious dreaming called space. 
not to the beach to surf cascading blue waters, not to the park for hot dogs and Little League, not to the movies for popcorn and the monster that swallowed Cleveland. No, not for me and my pals. Instead, it was to the garage with Ico kits in hand and soldering guns in tow, hasty blueprints and CO2 cartridges and slide rules flying. We'd be up all night until that special day came when we hiked solemnly to the park to fire the mighty rocket we'd made. First to Mars, it had written proudly on its side. In a bang, it would soar out of sight, straight up, and we'd time it to see how high it was, it went. Suddenly, with a thump, it would hurtle down from the heavens and spearhead not meters from the ground where the ground was seared from its glorious launch. Next came those parachute rockets, then the two-stage rockets, then a rocket with a camera on board. I recall being almost being in a fever, looking at the photos. Wow, there was the horizon with patches of blue trees from hundreds of feet up. In those days, we really felt we could do it. We could start with ordinary backyard stuff and a handful of equations from high school physics, and we could just maybe make a rocket that would well, go beyond the sky. Well, not really, you know, but just maybe. After all, someday soon it'd be done by the Air Force's X-15 and that program called NASA, and each of us wanted to be part of it. We wanted to be part of it more than you wanted your first kiss. <laughs> Thanks to the hard-won triumphs of thousands of men and women like those who we are honoring at this conference, Space exploration is now an astonishing reality. And with it, we have begun in earnest to ask, on an empirical scientific basis, whether it is possible for life to evolve elsewhere than on planet Earth. And already, we have tantalizing glimpses, though highly controversial, of possible evidence that might confirm it. I'm thinking, first of all, of course, about the meteorite sample ALH 84001, discovered in Antarctica in 84, and that's been discussed so far. And I'm also sure we all know studies of the surface reveal what might be microfossils, suggesting a very early form of life, but they could e equally well be inorganic or terrestrial in origin. What about the upcoming missions to the oceans of the Jovian satellite Europa? Will we discover life there beneath its, fr its frozen oceans? If we do, Apparently, it would, not, it would be indigenous and not due to contamination from Earth, as the Mars sample might. But let's take a bigger view. Even if, even if we can find no evidence of life in the solar system, what about life elsewhere in the universe? First step, of course, would be the discovery of planets orbiting other stars. And as we've heard already in the past two days, this has happened. This is one of the first photographs suggesting that planet-building material exists around other stars. It is a computer-enhanced image of an edge-on disk of matter orbiting the star Beta Pictoris, about 77 light-years away. It's thanks to the University of Arizona and Jet Propulsion Labs. Hubble shows us these four protoplanetary disks seen silhouetted against the background gas of the Orion Nebula. Here's the brown dwarf that Alan Boss showed us yesterday, we saw again today, the faintest object ever imaged orbiting another star. Alan also showed us this data from 51 Pegasus. Here a large planet with perhaps half the mass of Jupiter, as he explained, orbits 51 Pegasus in 4.2 days. Now to spare no expense, we actually have a photograph of that planet coming up. There it is. Sorry, Alan. Actually, this is artist Lynette Cook, who gave us a stunning impression of what the Jovian-like planet might look like. Of course, finding planets is one thing. Finding evidence of in in intelligent life is another. That's just what Project SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is all about. By scanning millions of channels of the radio spectrum from nearby stars in the local arm of our galaxy, SETI scientists and others 
hoped one day to receive a signal <clears throat> that would settle the question once and for all, at least for within a few thousand light years of Earth. What would the discovery <clears throat> of extraterrestrial life mean to us? Some scientists have suggested that life itself has little significance whether or not we're literally alone in the universe. They see life as essentially meaningless, a random product of physics and chemistry of no more significance than the wetness of water or the structure of Saturn's rings. It's just what matter does when really unusual conditions occur. But the universe at rock bottom is just endless mass energy in curving space-time, what matter does in the simplest conditions. That is certainly the impression one gets from theoretical physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg in his often quoted conclusion from his 1979 book, The First Three Minutes, where he wrote, <clears throat> it is almost irresistible <coughs> for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe, that human life is not just a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents reaching back to the first three minutes, but that we were somehow built in from the beginning. It is very hard for to realize that life on Earth is just a tiny part of an overwhelmingly hostile universe. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. <clears throat> I disagree with the view. Instead, I think the very fact of life, even if it has only evolved on our planet, is the key to the universe itself. From his research post at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, physicist Freeman Dyson puts this alternative nicely in his Gifford lectures, Disturbing the Universe. He writes, <clears throat> quote, the laws of subatomic physics leave a place for mind in the discovery of every molecule, in the description of every molecule, excuse me. I do not feel like an alien in this universe. The more I examine the universe and study its details, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. And in his 1985 Gifford lectures, Infinite in All Directions, Dyson presses the point more forcefully against Weinberg. He explicitly rejects Steve Weinberg's opinion, telling us instead he sees, quote, a universe growing without limit in richness and complexity, a universe of life surviving and making itself known to its neighbors across the unimaginable gulfs of space and time. 20th century science provides a solid foundation for our philosophy of hope. I agree with Dyson, and I want to move the claim forward another step. Even if the universe were basically devoid of life, I believe the presence of life on Earth would be a clue to the meaning of the universe as a whole. Let me illustrate this in the following way. Suppose you are lost and thirsty in a vast, dry desert. Suddenly, you spot a palm tree on the horizon. Are you going to say, well, since the desert is so vast and barren, that wavy tree is insignificant, a statistical fluke, not worth taking seriously. Hardly. Instead, its very scarcity makes it a tremendous discovery, for a hidden spring of life-giving water lies at its roots, shaded beneath its swaying branches. I feel that way about Earth. This blue-green watery jewel is like a, the palm tree in what might in fact be a vast interstellar desert. Here the spirit of the living God, <clears throat> working patiently in, through, and within the processes of biological evolution over countless generations, has produced what is arguably the most remarkable construction in the galaxy, the primate central nervous system. The number of connections between the neurons of the human brain is greater than the number of stars in the Milky Way. This staggering complexity makes possible, and we're still not really sure how, the almost unimaginable feat of self-consciousness, of knowing oneself as a free moral agent in the world. On our planet, at least, we are privileged to discover a hint of what God's intentions 
must have been in creating a universe like this, with its own particular laws of science. For when the evolutionary conditions are right, as they have been on Earth, and as they may be elsewhere in the galaxy, God, the continuous, imminent, ongoing creator of all that is, working with and through nature, creates a species with the capacities for reason, language, imagination, tool making, social organization, and self-conscious moral choice. A creature which can enter into covenant with God, the ultimate source of life. Thus, if it takes a thousand million stars to produce the conditions for the possibility of a sea urchin, if it takes a billion years of tinkering with genetic dice to produce a hummingbird, and if it takes a million years of scratching on bark and vocalizing intentions to produce a child who could reach out through human artifacts and chalkboard calculations and touch the edge of the visible universe, then the universe itself points back to our planet as signaling its true meaning. Life, then, is surely the pearl of great price. Yet, at a deeper level, it is not really a question of statistical odds, which makes life special, but what life inherently evolves, involves, and offers. That's, what I'm not, that's why I'm not particularly impressed with the many worlds arguments which are meant to neutralize the significance of life by an even grander statistical argument. Here one stipulates that a countless series of real universes exist, each with a different set of physical laws and natural constants. Of course, as the argument goes, life evolved in that universe in which the conditions for it, for evolution, were just right, just happened to be. But once again, I don't believe that the significance of life ultimately lies in statistics. Instead, it lies in the way each stage of life internalizes the whole history of life's immense journey, the way genes, organs, limbs, and so on gather together, recapitulate, and give an emerging meaning to all of the past conditions of the planet, which together have made life possible. <clears throat> And it is the way life allows those eons of evolution to take the elements of matter, the stardust of the billion-year-old past, and bring it to consciousness of itself as a self who knows itself and discovers this journey. If it took the precise characteristics of this universe to allow for the evolution of life, even if only on Earth, then it is life as such that gives significance to the true meaning of the universe, even to a countless series of universes. <clears throat> Put theologically, I see life as the infleshing of God's intention, biological evolution as the ongoing means of God's expressing God's purposes in creating all that is, and creatures with rationality and moral conscience as being, at least in one sense, in the imago dei, the image of God, for it is life like this which offers to nature nature's conscious experience of the God who acts in nature. Given this, the question of extraterrestrial life is all the more compelling. When I look at the night sky, I feel swathed in the eloquent silence of those countless stars. Yet that silence beckons to me. On a clear night, I feel overwhelmed with yearning with a sense of presence coming from those distant, twinkling lights. Have you too felt the urge to go there, to discover our destiny as a species? To use Carl Sagan's eloquent image, I feel as though I am standing on the shore of an immense ocean, touching waters that extend from here to infinity. Who else might be out there, touching those same waters, hoping to find their own answers to the riddle of their own existence, I believe that if we discover extraterrestrial life, what we learn about it can shed real light on a whole variety of questions about life that are as old as humanity. In this sense, I think theology, as part of that conversation, can make some very general predictions about what intelligent life might be like if it has evolved, 
And this at least suggests the possibility of theology making a kind of empirical claim which then could be tested within the context of the discovery of life. Let's look briefly at them. First, I think most of us would agree that being human involves rationality and moral agency. Each of us daily faces fundamental ethical decisions, decisions about the dignity and equality of individuals, about mercy for the weak and imprisoned, about justice and liberty. Anthropologists tell us that the combined capacities for reasoning, for toolmaking, for language, for social organization, for symbolic representation, and for ethical behavior emerge together in hominid evolution. But do we know for sure that rational and moral capacities necessarily co-evolve? Or did it only happen by chance on Earth, a kind of fluke of one particular evolutionary history? This question is profoundly important to our own understanding of ourselves. But it is truly hard to answer in principle, partly because we have only ourselves, other primates, and more indirectly, other terrestrial species to study. And we, are, we all share a common planetary history. Thus, the discovery of extraterrestrial life could bear directly on this question and link this year's conference with the subject of the Nobel Conference last year. Let us assume that complex biological creatures have evolved elsewhere in the galaxy and that they are endowed with the power of reason, tool making, and so on. Will they too be engaged in ethical issues? Will extraterrestrial life respect life? Will they live in harmony within and between species? Will they cure diseases, forgive their enemies, offer the lives for another? I believe they will since it seems to me that both the exercise of reason as so profoundly characterized by science and the nurturing of virtue as so compellingly demanded by religious practice are irreducible components of what constitutes genuine personhood. And this gets at a part of what theology means by the Imago Dei. Each contributes to what personhood means and neither is sufficient without the other. I am reminded of the famous quotation by Einstein, quote, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. In a similar way, Pope John Paul II, in a recent text, wrote, religion needs science to free it of superstition, and science needs religion to cleanse it of idolatry and false absolutes. Together, I see them forming a mutual partnership which can immeasurably benefit individuals and society. I would take this a step further by insisting that the practice of science is inherently guided by the requirements of virtue, and the adherence to religion demands a rigorous engagement with rationality and science. If this is true, science and religion are internally intertwined within the double province of reason and morality which, through the empowering and transformative grace of God, work to form human character. But if this situation is applicable just to humanity, or perhaps, sorry, is the situation applicable just to humanity, perhaps a part of the particular, even peculiar, evolutionary journey we inherit? Or is this, like life itself, a clue to what is universally valid wherever intelligence evolves? we may never be able to settle this fundamental question, this fundamental debate, until the discovery and long-term interaction with extraterrestrial life. <clears throat> Second, intimately connected with this question is the following. If ET experiences conscience, will it inevitably experience moral failure? This is truly an ancient question embodying a painful riddle at the heart of human existence. Why do we act with a level of violence against our own kind and other species which far exceeds the needs of survival and the level of violence of all other forms of life on Earth? Why do we lust after power and indulge in the travesties of racism, sexism, and speciesism? Put theologically, why do we sin? Why do we fail to love and serve God and one another and all of creation 
and instead indulge ourselves in unbridled pride and inordinate sensuality. Perhaps then the encounter with extraterrestrial life will help us come to terms with this fundamental human dilemma, for we will presumably discover whether it too wrestles with questions about moral choice and moral failure. Of course, the problem can be exaggerated so starkly that it leaves only two equally superficial, superficial alternatives. Leave it to Hollywood to capture these, these extremes in such memorable thrillers as Independence Day, where the aliens are so demonic as predators that they offer no compromise to earthlings, or that lovable, cuddly alien E.T. gifted with an almost angelic innocence. <laughs> Clearly, the options are much more subtle for what extraterrestrial life might be like. But I would offer a third alternative to either of these. I do not believe that the propensity to sin is an inherent part of our biological or evolutionary makeup. Nor do I believe it is really possible to just think our way out of it by education, reason, or the power of will. The first option transfers the responsibility for our actions to something else than our personal choice. People say, I couldn't help it, it's in my genes. The second option tantalizes us with what is in the end a futile and debilitating false hope the fool's gold of the self-help, just say no syndrome. So why then do we sin? Perhaps the best we can say, or more aptly, the least misleading response I can think of, is that the formation of authentic human virtue requires a lifetime of genuine wrestling with tough moral choices, and even more painfully, the confession and repentance of actual moral failure. By such hard choices, I mean having to choose not only between good and evil, but even more poignantly between competing goods, between self and other, between family and foreigner, between one's own life and the life of another, even of one's enemy. This continuing process of choosing and acting, of acknowledging failure and starting again, is, I believe, essential to the forging of character the formation of personhood. Moreover, since I believe for theological reasons that human life on Earth is a genuine clue to the nature of life in the universe and not just a terrible moral or evolutionary fluke, I believe extraterrestrial life will experience much of the same kind of moral dilemma that characterizes human existence. Clearly, an encounter then with E.T. could go a long way in helping settle this empirical question. This leads to our last and most trenchant question, related to the first two. Suppose that the arduous struggle of conscience is part of what makes life genuinely moral, both here and elsewhere in the universe. Will extraterrestrial life experience an empowering for that struggle by a source that transcends its natural capacities? Or will healing and the achievement of moral maturity be possible by the rational efforts of these creatures alone? Put into theological language, will the God who creates all, that is, all that is, be present and active to the struggles of life throughout the galaxy? And will God's grace redeem and sanctify every species in which moral and in which reason and moral conscience are kindled. This would be my assumption, since again I expect that what is irreducible to human experience is a clue to the experience of rational moral agency wherever it has evolved. But it is of course entirely possible that other species in the galaxy will be able to undergo the process of moral healing entirely through the powers of their own natures a kind of moral bootstrapping into ethical maturity. Well, if and when we encounter ET, I hope I'll be around to see these questions answered. I'd like to close with three slides that epitomize where we've come from, our discussion of space exploration and its wider meaning. 
This, the first, is that wondrous photograph of stars being born in the clouds of M16. What more moving experience could we have of the beauty of this universe? What more compelling connection with it and with its ultimate source, the God who creates in love, beauty, truth, and joy? The second is Earth, viewed from Apollo 11. So far, at least, all of human history has occurred on this splendid brown and white and blue-green jewel. But I, for one, believe our destiny lies in space. We will always remember our home. Indeed, we will carry her dust in our flesh, her tides in our circulatory rhythms, her myriad species in our genes, and her wisdom in our spirit. Behind this, we will carry the stardust of that once yielding star whose supernova produced these elements. Lying further behind this, we carry the beginnings of the universe in which all things trace their origins. Ultimately, behind and within all this, there lies the transcendent source of existence, the imminent God, our ongoing creator. But we shall not stay here forever on this planet, the nursery of our species. We shall explore the final frontier. Journeying out among the stars, perhaps discovering life and an interstellar community almost beyond our present imaginings. And awaiting us in the future of our future and journeying with us along the treacherous and joyous path will be that same God, our imminent closest friend and our final home. How the heavens are changing and I believe their changes and ours with them are taking us endlessly and gently by God's gracious guidance towards that eternity when all shall be in God and all shall rejoice in the cosmic journey home. Thank you. Now, now you may send up your God questions. Thanks, Bob. That was beautiful. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Russell. That was beautiful. Uh, I'm allowed one question each Nobel conference. Bob, did your God wipe out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago on this earth? <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. It brings up the whole question of uh, pain and suffering and God's relation to it. It's the ancient question of Job. Why does pain and suffering exist if you're God? And the answer is, I will bring about healing and transformation and a coming home for all who suffer. I'm a God of salvation, not a God of violence and pain and suffering. So the answer is, however one works it out, that God works within the processes to bring about their healing and their forgiveness. Can I follow on and ask, um, would you make a similar answer if an object were to come along and render us extinct? That's an, another excellent question. It's going to be quite an afternoon. <laughs> now, I think, um, let me get at a deeper position here. 
theology shouldn't be seen as dogmatic, that is, you know, digging in its feet like a mule and unwilling to undergo a radical change in its position. Sure, there could be evidence which would be so compelling that I would undergo a conversion. Or I would undergo a radical shift in my beliefs. And issues like the extinction of dinosaurs or the potential extinction of humanity or nuclear destruction, nuclear winter, um, or the Holocaust can provide such radical evidence that one really shifts in the conversations about faith in God. I think you have to be ready for that and face it openly. Uh, and I respect the question. Professor Sargdev. Yeah. Uh, if uh, there is a serious debate, if there, is, there was serious debate between science and religion, uh, as uh, you uh, formulated it, it uh, uh, if God initially uh, decided to set up the rules, maybe in forms of mathematical equations, and uh, formulated initial conditions, and set everything in motion, beginning with the Big Bang, then the real question is, the real uh, debate which may arise between scientific community and uh, 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 theologists is uh, not uh, in the fact whether this type of God existed or not, but whether there is a need in a continuous intervention from the God in the process of developing the, the mo this motion. Uh, as uh, David Stevenson asked, uh, is it enough to have initial conditions and then to get everything? Uh, so uh, I think at least for this part of question, uh, future natural science could bring an answer. I don't know when, maybe when we would discover the life on other planets or uh, would discover the, uh, the clue how life was originated. If it is the case, well, would you insist that the God is present, uh, is moved to political science, to moral issues? <clears throat> Let me respond to the question by framing the, the conversations that are going on right now between theologians and scientists. Uh, the ones I work with, many of whom are present here, would want to, um, would not want to engage in an interventionist notion of God's action. That is, we do not think of God as breaking the laws of nature to achieve God's actions or, or intentions. So whatever I would say, I would have to be able to do it in a way in which it's consistent with the laws of science we know. And initial conditions, too. It's easy to say God set up the initial conditions, but I'm working at the heart of question. How do I believe in the God of Israel and the God of the ch Christian church, which is an ongoing acting God, a God to whom prayer is effective, a God that saved Israel from Egypt, a God that worked through even the Babylonian exile to bring um, a deeper sense of faith to Israel. That is a God who acts in history, providence, as well as a God who acts in, in lives. And the trick is to recognize that the church has been split between the conservatives who do it by intervention. God breaks the laws of nature, and that doesn't help us do science and religion. Or the liberals who say God doesn't really do anything. Everything is just nature. God set it up and let it go. And many of us are trying to find a non-interventionist approach which allows for God to act in evolution, in geology, in all of the natural sciences without breaking the laws of nature. When human beings come around and you've got moral agency and intentional volition, that's another story. I assume I can act freely without breaking the laws of physics. I can choose whether to jump or not. I can't choose whether I fall or not. So I assume I have moral free agency, and therefore I assume God can interact with me as, two, as persons do. But I'm talking about a billion, two billion, three billion years ago when life was evolving. How do I account for that? And the, of course the way I account for that is look at the very processes of genetic variation in which quantum mechanics shows an open universe, a universe which is not deterministic. Just as Professor Stevenson talked about, chaos is showing an open universe, which I think we would discuss further. But if there is, the, if it's the case that science itself tells us that natural processes are not entirely self-governing, that is, they, they don't set up a sufficient set of conditions for their own evolution, and quantum mechanics certainly says that, 
then one can see God acting within the very place where people like Dawkins and Minot and the rest say God can't act. That is, in the very level of genetics, which in, is the mechanism of evolution. In any case, however I do it, I want to agree with you that the test for me and others is to find a way to think about God as the God of the biblical faith of uh, the biblical faith of God who acts without it being a God who breaks the laws of nature to act. If I can't do that, I failed. Story Musgrave. Bob, I intuitively feel that what we have been up to uh, at this conference, and that is taking the universe in scientific terms, in images, in art forms that touch people to the heart, giving the universe to people intellectually and artistically so that it touches them from subatomic particles to the furthest galaxies, I intuitively feel that that works as a moral force and that people are going to transcend uh, tribalism, uh, racism, and all, and, and sin in general, as you put it. Do you also think that that can work in, in that way? And what is the mechanism by which it, it may be working? Thanks, Dory. I do think that the kind of depth encounter with the beauty of the universe and our connection to it, and also the puzzle of how we came about through apparently blind, random, events, moves the human spirit to ask these kinds of questions. And as I've heard you say yourself, I think um, our sense of yearning for connection to other life in the universe isn't just a kind of neurosis or kind of speciesism. I think it's a fundamental yearning for the nature itself to find its own meaning. The word I would use is spirit. This is the geist of our time. This is the spirit. I think it's what my generation sensed when we were all kids and wanted to go to Mars. <laughs> There's this absolute sheer joy in discovery and in the sense of self you get out of it. I mean, to put it short, it's both the astonishment of what's there independent of you that you didn't know about, that changes you, and it's the inner joy of feeling connected to that, through that experience which relates you to it. <laughs> and that dialectic, to me, is best thought of in terms of the human spirit. And I think, at least for me, and I know for you, space captures that ecstasy. Ellen Glass. Yeah. Are there philosophers or religious thinkers who take the widest possible interpretation and simply equate God with the cosmos to say that God is the universe and the universe is therefore in all of us? We are of God. They do, and I think that's an important move to make. It can take one of several forms, Alan. One form is pantheism, where you simply say the universe is God, and, and that's fine. I mean, Spinoza was an excellent example of a pantheist, and there are, you can read Carl Sagan as being that way if you like. Um, another form is to say, well, there isn't anywhere in the universe that isn't in the immediate divine presence, but the presence that you're in, that the presence in, in which you're in is of a presence which utterly transcends anything like you've ever known before. So as we talk, I feel you're, you as a person talking to me, but the experience of God is infinitely more than that because it's an experience of a divine who's within me, but the, within, the God that's within me transcends me utterly. Now, a good term for that is panentheism. All things are in God, but God transcends all things. A thing I think we, we want to avoid is the kind of old-fashioned deism where you just get a God to start things off and then God goes out to lunch and the universe is, runs by itself on blind chance. And if that were the case, and then if you disproved T equals zero, you might sort of disprove that God. Well, I don't really care. That's deism. There's no, there's no joy in that God. You can't pray to that God. You can't have a relationship to that God. <laughs> you can't see yourself as special. So I would say that whether you take a pantheist view or a panentheist view, as I would take, the, the direction to go in is, is to assert that to exist is to be in the presence of God. It isn't as though, well, where is God? It's, it's more like recognizing this is the divine presence. But the, that which is present is ultimately absolute mystery beyond any possible description. Comments from any other panelists? 
Okay, I have one question from the audience. If God created the universe or universes, and if in this vast creation we are a tiny speck of life and a moment in time, does it make sense to believe that this God is particularly interested in us and our earth in a, in a protective way? I think it relates to the question that Professor Stevenson raised, which is how do we know that we won't get wiped out? And of course we don't. I mean, I don't think God's interested in our planet in a protective way any more than I'm interested in, the, in those I love in a patronizing or paternalistic way, but in a way of genuine caring because of their beauty and dignity in my relation to them. So I think what my argument was that rather than seeing our statistical scarcity as meaning our meaninglessness, I was trying to argue you can just as easily see our statistical scarcity to be a, a sign of our meaningfulness in what we offer to nature that nature in the terms of rocks and stars can't offer to itself, that is to reflect on itself and to marvel in the astonishment that it exists. I think that's part of what God gives us. I also don't think that the meaning of life is in its indefinite continuity. If we are wiped out, that isn't really a sign of whether or not God is part of that process, because the process isn't judged by its beginning and end, but by its all of the meaning. I was born, I'm going to die, that's inevitable. I don't think my faith in God depends on whether or not I somehow don't die, nor does my faith in the meaning of life on earth depend upon whether or not a meteor doesn't wipe us out. On the other hand, I'd do everything I could to stop it because I like life. <laughs> okay, thank you. That concludes our talks for this afternoon. I would like to remind everyone of uh, this evening's events, the banquet at 6.30 for those have, who have tickets, and um, Story Musgrave will be speaking here at approximately 7.30. Thank you. Let's see. Huh? <laughs>